Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. With me tonight is my colleague, Clay Jones, and we are honored to have with us the Drug Truth Network himself. Welcome, Dean Becker. Hey, Bru Buford, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. And uh, we got a great show for you today, yeah. I think, don't we? Oh, yeah. I think so. Uh, the city of Houston was kind of full of excitement this weekend with a little old show over at the Baker Institute at Rice. And I understand you Thursday. were both there. Thursday evening and Friday uh, all day. Yeah, th Thursday evening, Rick Steves, the PBS travel writer and uh, you yeah. know videographer, was on. Gave a speech kind of talking about travel in Europe and uh, the differences between how drugs are treated here in the U.S. versus how it is in Europe and the rest of the world, for yeah. that matter. And then there was uh, uh, the all-day session, Friday. Yeah. Started off with a debate between Ethan Nadelman and what was that guy, John? Uh, former head of operations for the Drug Enforcement Administration. Okay. And uh, it was, uh, needless to say, well, I won't use <laughs> slaughter, but it, there was John nothing. John Coleman. Uh, John Coleman. Oh there was God. nothing from the DEA or uh, anybody uh, that believes in drug war that could counter the uh, overwhelming evidence of the need for change. Well, you know, the thing that surprises me more and more as time goes by is how very little of substance the DEA and the ONDCP have to say about anything. Right. I mean, right. they flap jaws a lot and there's a lot of hot air coming out, but when you start looking, there's just nothing in it. You know, after uh, John Coleman spoke, they had a little break, everyone's out getting yeah. snacks and coffee, yeah. and I, I run into him, and uh, yeah. they weren't allowing uh, questions from the audience right. to the speakers. Right. And I said, John, I didn't get a chance to ask you my question. He said, well, I'm fair, go ahead, ask yeah. your question. So just sitting there next to yeah. the, the croissants, I, I said, okay, it goes like this. All of the corruption, which involves empowering our terrorist enemies, enriching these barbarous Latin cartels, yeah. giving reason for more than 30,000 violent yeah. U.S. gangs selling contaminated drugs to our children, what is the benefit? Yeah. What have we derived that more than offsets all this horrible blowback? Yeah. That's pretty much verbatim. And his yeah. response was, that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the point of it is, that's the question that needs to be asked of, of President Obama or our drug czar Gil Kerlikowski yeah. with all the cameras going, because yeah. that's the day the drug war begins to dissolve. Well, I noticed that this morning's Houston Chronicle had a brief bio of the new head of the local office of the DEA, and he's a career drug enforcement officer, been in it for well over 20 years, started out down in South Texas, and in this whole long-term career in drug enforcement, the highlight of his career was shooting Pablo Escobar, and that's what, 25 years ago now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they tend to dredge up <laughs> whatever history and propaganda they can to, to yeah. justify what's going on now. And, of course, yeah. again, we're empowering the Taliban. We're, we're, yeah. uh, Shorty Guzman, head of the Sinaloa cartel, is a billionaire. He's in a, uh, the Forbes, Forbes 500. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these gangs, uh, about $100 billion a year flows into the pockets of these yeah. gangs here in the United States if they'll just dare sell drugs to our children. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's one thing that's yeah. bothered me for all of these many years, we keep talking about drug salesmen. But when I hear salesmen, I think of a used car salesman or the guy peddling vacuum cleaners door to door. <laughs> Viagra, maybe. Yeah. The thing about <laughs> drugs is you don't have to sell them. They sell People themselves. People come up and ask for them. Well, sure, sure. These guys aren't salesmen. They are money recipients. <laughs> I, I think it's Cialis. They say if you have more than a four-hour erection, you should seek a doctor's help. I think that's a selling point, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say what my response to that is. Man. I'm not going to call my doctor. He doesn't do anything for me. I'll call my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, get another girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh... The, the, the conference, to me, yeah. uh, honestly, I felt that I've been to dozens, if yeah. not scores, of conferences yeah. over the years. This was the first one where 
both sides were represented, yeah. and our side just waxed them, just just blew them out of the water because they were left feebly trying to cling to yeah. these old rumors and hysteria and propaganda, yep. with no new ammunition to, to to bring forward, and and the audience was laughing at them many times. Well, the thing the thing that got me is that the Baker Institute is about as high profile, high status, a public policy and academic institution as you can find. As you can find. And as near as I can remember, this is probably the highest level legitimate conference on the drug laws that I can remember. Yep. Yep. But, well, how did the audience react to it? Well, what was the chatter in the well, coffee as, breaks and around? As it? I said, no. During the yeah, discussion, yeah. there was one point where, uh, well, we're, we're probably going to hear from uh, uh, yeah. the assistant police chief. I can't think of his name. Yeah. He was putting forward how horrible it is as a police officer, and you go into a, a convenience store and the clerk's laying, you know, bleeding on the floor yeah. because someone was stealing money for drugs. Yeah. And uh, uh, he, he talked about how. The overdoses uh, from drugs are horrendous, and that what brought a, a bit of laughter from the audience. He said that two out of every five overdoses they find marijuana in their system, <laughs> 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 and, and as if that were a contributing factor or something. And it did; it brought uh, chuckles from the audience because they're that lacking in, well, in ammunition. That's like I, I'm sure you're aware of the Dawn Network statistics. That's the one where they collect data on drug-related emergency room admissions. Oh, yes. But the way they define drug-related, if you sat on a park bench and smoked a joint and a satellite fell out of the sky and squished you to death, that would be a marijuana-related <laughs> admission. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, because they can find it in your bloodstream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, that's... You know, just from listening what was going on at, at that convention, yeah. it really made me think that the drug war is starting to come to an end. Yeah. Just by the way everybody was speaking. Uh, Dryden, uh, uh, what's her name, Pat Lycos. She was probably the... She was the funniest of the oh, lot. Yes. Well, yeah, what what she, did our district attorney have to say? Well, I think we're going to hear a segment okay. from her a bit later. I, I hesitate to jump into well, it. Well, why don't we take a break and listen to some of this? All right. Sounds like a good idea. Okay. Fighting for what Drug Policy Alliance is fighting for is to move both the debate over drug policy and the policies themselves from... The policies right now are over here. The debate is either over here about, as far as I say, moving the chairs around the Titanic of drug prohibition, or it's the ping pong legalization thing. The really meaningful debate is going to be when we get over here. The really meaningful, we know, based upon all the available science and evidence and history and everything, that the optimal drug policy is going to be over here. And by over here, what I mean is someplace between Milton Friedman's vision, right, of the, of the free market, but regulated, and over here which is a prohibitionist model, but embedded in the principles of decriminalization, public health, human rights, what have you, right? The Drug Policy Alliance, my organization, leading organization of the country, really the world, the people advocate for alternative drug policy, what we represent is... Come on, this is a gram, okay? Now, we were prosecuting people for state jail felonies for trace cases. Sometimes they had a little flake extruding from, mucus extruding from their nose, a little flake here, maybe a little residue in a crack pot. So we began research, and we discovered the minimum amount that can be tested twice, due process, state and defense, right? It's one one hundred of this. One one hundred, and we had thousands of those cases clogging up our dockets, thousands of people in jail, overcrowding the jail. So then we did further research. Bear County, San Antonio, their minimum threshold is one one hundredth of a gram. Travis County, Austin, I know they're weird, but one one hundredth of a gram. 
Perry County is double that, two one hundredths of a gram. So then we put together this policy. We met with the command staff of the Houston Police Department. We met, say, with the Sheriff's Office. We met with our Harris County Criminal Justice Council and laid it all out. There were no objections. The only thing that HPD asked is that we do a study in six months to see the effect. I want you all to understand that when someone is arrested for a trace case, that officer is out of service two to three hours. <coughs> that neighborhood is unprotected for two to three hours. And with your overcrowded jail and your overcrowded dock. So I told the law enforcement officers, I want you to arrest the, the drug dealer and the person who supplied the drug, the drug dealer and the person who supplied that and the bulk cash couriers and so forth. I want you to work your way all the way up there and cut the head off the snake, okay? Because these are transnational criminal organizations that are involved. Now, I know you all think I'm all warm and fuzzy. <laughs> But I want you to stop and think of the effect on especially young people to have a record for a state jail felony. They'll be unemployable, unable to get certain licenses, and so forth. Okay? In addition to that, to talk about surreal, first offense burglary of a motor vehicle is a misdemeanor, and a trace is a state jail felony. So officers are getting time and a half to fight the drug war, and this is their drug war arrest, time and a half to go to court. So the union bosses are not happy with me. Now. <laughs>
in the case that citations are used, turns that on its head and requires the use of recognizance bonds in nonviolent misdemeanor cases. Well, we can basically say that the judges, through their needing bonds for everybody, is keeping more sh uh, sheriffs in the jail than on the street to protect us. And uh, you've got yeah. to throw into the equation, the, the police patrolmen's unions here in Houston uh, control the agenda as best they can, and those arrests for marijuana and for the trace cases all lead to overtime. Well, for a time and a half. It's not just the overtime. <clears throat> it also is something in many ways much more important to the policeman. Shaking someone down for a trivial drug case or a marijuana case is a great way to flip them and make them turn informer and give over their supplier. Yep. It's a great harassment charge. It's the charge that we used to sneeringly call when I was practicing law, abuse of cop. Yep. It's what the policeman can do to you when he doesn't like your attitude. And as I say, it lets them hassle guys that they think are just bad guys and need to get out of the neighborhood. It makes their informers to get other people. So it's not just the overtime. It, uh, well, Lousy, poorly trained police count on these harassment arrests to do their job for them. And it does help because, uh, let's face it, drug charges are easy. Uh, if you got a bag of something, you can get a jury or you can, you can get a, a plea bargain out of that situation nearly always. And it helps them to have a high number of successful well, arrests now that's and, the and other productivity. Thing. For 30 years now, every police force I have heard from says, no, we don't have a quota system. But if you talk to any officer on the street, if he doesn't make eight arrests a month, He's in bad trouble with the sergeant or the lieutenant. The quota system still there, it's just not called that. And marijuana arrests are cocaine arrests that really don't require any evidence at all are a great way to make up that number. To so have, have a successful career. This, this, this is another one of those examples of the way the drug laws had just thoroughly corrupted the entire law enforcement system. Yes, but there's states that are working to correct it. The people of states, Colorado, Washington, well, Oregon. Uh, I was reading an article from, I believe it um, was from Connecticut, one of the New England states that has just instituted a citation system for arrests. And in a middle-sized city, a few hundred thousand people, the amount of money they documented saving the city in the first year of this was mind-boggling. It was in the millions. Millions, just, yes. Just for this one simple thing. They've been so, doing it in Chicago also. They yeah, just started it. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Again, talking about the, the yeah. marijuana arrests and, and yeah. the, the police time involved, yeah. it's even more widespread, uh, the, the money saving potential yeah. is even more widespread. In Austin, they did a story one time talking about not doing these trips saves them gas money. Yeah. Because you know, let's think about it. What is the price of gas mm -hmm. now, nowadays? What does it cost in the county to fuel yeah. all those police cars? Mm -hmm. And then here in Houston, we're still filling our jail to near unconstitutional levels. We're still shipping some people out of state to Louisiana and other prisoners. Well, Not as many as we once were. No, but it's come down finally. Yes. But it's still, I think we finally slipped barely under the state limit. Right. But it's still busted to the seam. Right. And there's something else. Even at the most cut rate level, it costs us over $20 a day to house someone in county jail. Yep. And I mean, that's that's not even Motel 6 level accommodations. <laughs> no, uh, no, I've been there. And it, it, doesn't, there. it doesn't take very many thousands of arrests, even if they're just there for one night, 
to run up a pretty damn big hotel bill for the county to pay. But one more ramification okay. I wanted to bring up, too. Those people okay. that are caught with small amounts of marijuana yeah. go to jail. Maybe they don't have the money to bail themselves out, and they aren't getting the PR bond. Yeah. So they sit there for weeks, months, while well, waiting trial and, and disposition. They lose their job. They lose their job. They maybe their car, their, their apartment, maybe their girlfriend. Their apartment. And, and they, don't, they could have been earning money and maybe afforded a lawyer who could have gotten them off the charge in the first place. Yeah. And... That's the sad thing, is if you talk to people in law enforcement and government, they'll laugh at you and say, nobody goes to jail for marijuana anymore. That, that was, that's what they kept saying that's at the what, conference. But, but yeah, that's, that's what that's we're talking point. about here. Sitting in jail for a month, waiting to go to trial to get put on probation, well, is it, being in jail. Or even for time served. It, yeah. It's still a conviction. Yeah. But, People, they, they make you people uh, drug test, drug test, drug test, and they revoke people. It doesn't go as they're in jail for uh, marijuana, even though that's what they were revoked for. Yeah, it's parole, for. revocation. And then they're listed as being sentenced for the original charge. My joking version of that is, what's the penalty for smoking one joint? Ten years of hard time. Because All right, if you're That's on what happens to someone on... Probation. Yeah, who, who gets who caught with a bad gets urine. Gets caught with bad urine. Yeah. He does, goes without any way to avoid it, serves his entire original sentence. Well, look at um, Florida. They just passed more laws for urine tests. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, that's a case where the Florida government is throwing good money after bad because they just passed this new state employee drug test bill. And it wasn't more than a month or two ago that the federal courts threw out the Florida test the welfare applicant bill as being unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And it was 20 years or so ago that the Supreme Court said you cannot constitutionally test the urine of state and public employees without showing some sort of particular need for it. Yeah, well, this is election year engineering, isn't it? I mean, this is just a means to attract voters to their frenzy somehow. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a tactic that's liable to turn around and bite them before the year is over. Uh, yeah. With well, voter ID bills being held, accused of being unconstitutional by the Department of Justice today, with urine test bills, with, uh, I call it right by Bible, yeah, transvaginal uh, probing. Transvaginal <laughs> probing before abortions by pulling funding for women's health care clinics. I mean, these are all gut issues that I think are going to cost sitting politicians lots and lots and lots of votes this year. Yes. I sure hope you're right. <clears throat> but yeah. Let's get back to Florida. Okay. Florida, they're doing a ballot referendum. They're getting the signatures now. They're trying to put it on the ballot uh, for medical marijuana. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, and Florida, the state, is trying to already stuff it down people's throat. Oh, no, we get a drug test, drug test, drug test. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, passing medical marijuana doesn't solve the drug test problem. No, that just Look takes what's another... happens in... in Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado. <clears throat> the problem here and the joker, well, the real jokers, is the Federal Drug-Free Workplace Act, which requires large numbers of employers to maintain a drug-free workplace. Now, there are several ways that an employer can do that. But the easiest and cheapest is to drug test because that same law 
makes unemployment, compensation, and workers' comp insurance companies give discounts to employers that drug test. Let's take another break and see what else came out of the Baker Institute. Is that this war on drugs essentially says to me, Russ Belville, the federal government thinks you ought to be in a cage because you like to smoke pot. Now, if you'd like to go home and drink, you can drink Crown Royal until you pass out. That's fine. If you want to smoke, you can buy cigarettes and smoke until you get lung cancer and die. Don't got a problem with that. But if you want to smoke a little pot that never killed anyone, makes you happy, you want to eat Funyuns, makes jazz sound good, we got to put you in a cage. I just think that's fundamentally wrong. Now, to this question, war on drugs has failed. Is legalization the answer? Well, as Russ Jones, the very well named Russ Jones said, we don't have a war on drugs, we have a war on people. I have never seen a DEA agent point an automatic weapon at a marijuana plant. But a few of my friends working in dispensaries have had automatic weapons pointed at their heads. A few people that I've reported on have had armor-clad thugs breaking into their homes, throwing flash-bang grenades, wearing body armor, shooting their dogs while their children are in the house. But I have never seen them point that, that gun at a plant. And while it is a war on people, it's not really a war on all people who use drugs. Like comedian Paul Mooney once said, I have the complexion of protection. I'm a middle-aged white guy. I'm not going to get busted for weed. Probably never. Probably never. So it's not a war on people who use drugs. It's a war on some people who use drugs. And wait a minute, it's not even really a war on drugs because in this society we celebrate drugs. You can't turn on TV without seeing another drug ad. I mean, we got beer ads funding the Super Bowl. We got Viagra ads everywhere. Look, what's up with those two people in the bathtubs anyway? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we got the cartoon depression. Have you seen those drugs in the cartoon, the Abilify, where the woman's got depression? Is your antidepressant not helping? And she's got that robe of depression she wears around. Well, if that pill doesn't help you, we've got another pill to help them kill that doesn't help you. And notice that the depression robe never really goes away. It still kind of hangs out off the side. We're not curing anything. We're managing it. Because that's the comeback. That's where you get the comeback to part two. So it's not a war on all people who use all drugs. It's just some people using some drugs. And in fact, we celebrate drugs. Even, even the evil drugs. Cigarettes, even the evil one. The one we all know is awful and terrible. We at least tolerate it. I used to work at a company that had paid for by the company, a shelter outside, because we're in Portland, Oregon, it rains a lot, right? A shelter outside so the nicotine addicts could go and get their fix. Sounds different when I say it that way than smoke break, doesn't it? <laughs> nicotine addicts to get their fix, paid for by the company, and willing to accept the productivity loss of people heading out every two hours for 15 minutes to, to do their drugs. So don't tell me we don't have, we don't have a war on drugs we think drugs are bad. It's just some drugs and some of the people that are using them are bad. And when we call it a war on drugs, it's not even really a war on drugs, it's a war on marijuana. As was cited earlier, 52% of all the rest of the war on drugs are for marijuana, 88% for possession alone. Here in Texas, it's 97% of all marijuana arrests are for possession, as they were talking about trace amounts and such, too. So what we really have here is not a war on drugs. What we have here is a war on certain American citizens using non-pharmaceutical, non-alcoholic, tobacco-free drugs. That's what we have. <laughs> Well, in that clip, uh, one thing that I wanted to pay attention to was this idea that with the safe complexion, you're probably not going to get arrested. And I noticed, Clay, tonight that you're carrying around one of my favorite books, Michelle Alexander's I The New Jim got it. Crow. I just got uh, it. I believe Professor Alexander was here this weekend, wasn't she? No, she was. They had a oh, video. They had a present, video of her. A video, yeah. a really good uh, uh, yeah. resolution. That was from, I think, Alabama. But it it caught so much attention. Yeah. So many people just just zoned in on yeah. what she oh, was yeah. saying. I, uh, I, I'm privileged. I've had her live on my show yeah. t two times to talk about this. Just about six weeks ago, 
uh, I think she was on. And the, the fact of the matter is, she brings focus to bear on the fact that this is a war on black people. Uh, uh, Reverend Edwin Sanders was at yes, this conference, yeah. and he brought forward a phrase that I think should resonate mm -hmm. with the, the viewers out there. And that is, law enforcement is mining black gold. Each one of these prisoners, each one yeah. of these, these, these black men, mostly, that they get into prison, represents twenty to $30,000 in income uh, for powers within the state or for yeah. the private prisons that uh, house them. Well, I brought her name up for two reasons tonight. Uh, you and I have both have been pushing her book ever oh, since yeah. it first came out. And yes, it's, sir. It's really gone viral now. Oh, as it has. Can. It has. But uh, tonight I want to talk about a follow-up book that puts some flesh on the bones she's talking about. Uh, tonight's book is by Connie Rice. That's Connie, not Condi, although it turns out that they are cousins. Uh, <laughs> but Connie's book is Power Concedes Nothing. And it's her memoir of a career as a civil rights attorney in Los Angeles. Uh, she started out with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Those of you who know, know that that's their good uh, Marshall's old law firm. And she, with the help of a lot of others, I have to admit, took on the Los Angeles Police Department. She's the one that used the Rampart scandal to cause major reforms in the Los Angeles police. She has also worked directly with some of the low-income neighborhoods and has eliminated a lot of the gang problems by negotiating with the gangs on a reasonable person-to-person -person level. Uh, the book is, is a fantastic read by itself. She's a wonderful storyteller. Uh, when I read the little short half-page story of Pygmy, the nine-year-old assassin, that little half-page story had me crying and being mad enough to throw things at the same time. I probably have cried more reading this book than in any other book that I can remember. She's a gripping storyteller. So if you've read the Jim Crow, New Jim Crow, please look at Power Concedes Nothing by Connie Rice. And if you haven't read the New Jim Crow, get both of them and read them. Uh, as I say, she provides the context, the community, and at least some of the remedies for the problems that Professor Alexander puts out in the new Jim Crow. And in the next show, I'm going to add uh, a third book to the trilogy. So stay tuned to see what else I think fits in with these two super blockbuster books. You know, there's, a, there's another book, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to see. I don't remember the gentleman's name. It's, I believe the title is World War D. And it talks about uh, the drug war kind of as a uh, historical, yeah. um, current context, and to try to look at it from the as someone might from the future. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I've heard. I'll have to look at it. I, I've heard Ethan that. Nadelman use this this phrase. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is my hope that in the not too distant future we'll look back on this time of prohibition yeah. and the drug war in much the same way we currently yeah. look back at the time of slavery, okay. and and I think we'll we'll see that there's no logic to what we're doing. Now. Right. Now, the other reason I wanted to bring up Michelle Alexander, and this ties into some of the other things we were talking about. She, this last week, had a newspaper article when she was advocating that people with marijuana charges filed against them should demand their rights oh, for yeah. a jury trial. Yeah. Now, just like I have done, she admitted that as a lawyer, and in her case as a mother, she hesitates to tell people to turn down the sure probation and run the risk and expense of a jury trial. But her point is that 
If everybody insisted on their right to a trial by jury, you said 38,000 cases a year. Yeah, yeah. If we did that in Houston, the wheels would come off of the criminal justice system in a matter of months. They'd be rolling down the street. There is no way the police, the courts, the district attorney, the jails could handle it if everyone says, I want my constitutional rights. Now, I will also say that that doesn't mean just pick the first lawyer out of the phone book, go down to the courthouse and spend a half a day and a half ass, let's put a jury together and play the game. The real problem is that even on something like a misdemeanor offense, a real honest to gosh defense is going to involve expert witnesses, it's going to involve scientific testing, it's going to involve the lawyer putting in hours and hours and days and weeks of preparation time, which means that a piddling little six-month misdemeanor that you could plead out for probation is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars to defend. But somewhere out there in this country, there is a foundation or an institution or an individual giver who could put up the money just like is done for the Legal Defense Fund, just like is done for the Southern Poverty Law Center, just like is done for legal aid offices, to provide people who want it real, honest to gosh, bang up defenses in marijuana cases. And if one state, and I don't care which of the 50 states they picked out, if they concentrated on one state and provided all out, give them hell defense to anyone who wanted to try mm -hmm. their marijuana possession cases. In six months, that state would have to give up and legalize marijuana. We were talking about the cops spending three hours on the arrest. What about being under a subpoena as a defense witness and, and having to sit in the wait. courthouse for a week until the defense rests? Yeah. What happens if the police department has to answer a subpoena for that cop's entire personnel and disciplinary file and their court clerk under subpoena has to sit in the courthouse waiting to be called to testify? What happens if everyone that tested the marijuana in the police lab was subpoenaed and had to appear as a defense witness? What happens if the jury selection with the defense lawyer having a jury selection expert at his side takes a week to select the six people on the jury? How long would it take for the DA and the police to say, okay, we give up? I don't think it'd take a year, <laughs> <laughs> a month but, or less, maybe. But just like here, we're fighting more of the unions wanting uh, things to stay uh, status yeah, quo. Yeah, but that's why I'm saying don't make it stay status quo. Make the cops, make the city comptroller writing the police budget want to know why overtime has shot up 500 percent because every day of the week there are a dozen parole, patrol officers sitting on benches in the courthouse under subpoenas to testify why they can't get tests done in the police lab because all of the technicians are under subpoena and in the courthouse when the judge says, okay, you're on the docket, let me look. My next opening is 12 months from now. When the district attorney's office says, I don't have anyone to assign to that case because they're all in trial, then it doesn't matter what the police union say. True. But the policemen themselves can make life miserable for people. Just for a limited length of time. 
<laughs> you know, yesterday KPFT had their yeah. 42nd birthday at uh, okay. the Mucky Duck. Yeah. yeah. There was a you know a couple of uh, Harris County constables there, and I was wearing mm -hmm. a different Leap shirt, and I went over okay. and introduced myself. I've been meaning to ask, did you wear a Leap shirt to the Baker Institute? I did indeed. Okay. You bet I did. Uh, first day with suit and tie, second yeah. day Leap shirt. But I, I went up to the guy and I introduced myself. Yeah. I said. Uh, let me ask you, how many uh, pot smokers have you busted this month? And this will be in yeah. just a half month. Yeah. He said, about eight. And then he said, you know, I do pretty much uh, narcotics work. Yeah. And he says, I busted about 38 people in this, what, two-week two, yeah. two week period. And I said, well, do you think you've done any good that you're slowing down the flow of drugs? Yeah. And he said, well, no. And I said, do you think you'll ever do any good? Yeah. And he said, no, I don't guess I ever will. I said, well, doesn't it feel kind of futile to just keep doing this? He said, I'm just doing my job. He seemed like a nice enough guy, but yeah. that was the phrase that the Nazis used, too, where they were just following orders. Oh, well, and, and uh, you know, I, he may be a good cop, a good man. I don't know. But the point is, how long do we want to chase down this rabbit hole pretending we're doing some sort of good when, yeah. in essence, we're, we're not accomplishing anything? Well, you know, I, I find myself repeating three numbers time after time after time. Those three numbers are 200,000, 1 million, and 100 million. 200,000 was the total number of marijuana users in the country in 1937 when it was outlawed. And that's according to the Bureau of Narcotics' own figures. Negroes and jazz musicians. Yes. <laughs> 1 million is what the government surveys estimated were the total number of marijuana users in 1960. And that was just shortly after the federal government had made selling to a minor a capital offense. Capital, okay. In 1957. Yeah. 100 million is the estimate the government made for the number of adult Americans that had ever used marijuana in 2008. Right. Now, I don't think General Motors has a growth curve like that. <laughs> no, that's, that's so true. And, and the fact of the matter is that despite all their efforts, they have done nothing to stop the growth, the flow, the change. Yeah. Well, drugs are more plentiful on the street. They're cheaper. better. Yeah. They're cheaper. Um, I don't know. I think they've done a lot of good for the streets. <laughs> well, Save me some money. You know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, if, if the heroin that was coming onto the streets was 100% pure yeah. and remained 100% pure, it would be safer than the situation that we have now. Because now people buy 10%, 20%, 50%, so then, they then, they get a, then they get a 90% batch and it kills them. And, and the fact of the matter is... that, it, or in one case I remember many years ago, the heroin shortage in a locality was so hard that the dealer put fentanyl on the streets, mm -hmm. and just a little fentanyl was enough. Our case in Houston, less than 10 years ago, some guy got confused and sold a bunch of heroin to buyers that thought it was cocaine. Yeah, it wasn't even, that was six years ago. Yeah, it was six was years ago, recently. yeah. And, you fourteen know, people died one fourteen weekend. Fourteen people died in one weekend. Here in, in around Houston. Because they were injecting a lethal dose of heroin, thinking it was cocaine. Thinking it was cocaine. Yeah, because the the dealer was smart. He wasn't using it. No. He had no idea what was in that yeah. bag. He just knew he could make money from it. So he sold mm -hmm. it as if it were cocaine. The users bought it as if it were cocaine, injected it, and learned yeah. through their death that it was heroin. And in in Canada right now, they've had a whole rash of kids, teenagers and young adults, that have been getting very, very sick and even a few deaths. The newspapers claim from ecstasy pills, but we all know that ecstasy by itself is virtually harmless. Right. From tainted ecstasy pills, made not in regulated pharmaceutical plants, but in someone's back room. These were tainted, and people were killed with the result. Dance Safe, an organization that tested drugs at dance club, 
found that over 60% of the ecstasy pills they tasted were either totally fake or were polluted with some sort of misdemeanor. Well, what do we expect when we have this stuff made by untrained chemists using yeah. substandard products and And no and inspections of the plants. No, no, no let's, scientific oversight yeah. whatsoever. Let's take another break and see what we have. My name is Aslan. Many years passed since we, the Taliban, destroyed your towers in New York City. You started a war against us, the Taliban, but you could not uproot us. And you know why? Because we have the opium. The United Nations says Afghanistan produced the 90% of the world's heroin supply. Supply. The United Nations says Afghanistan produced the 90% of the world's heroin supply. We buy the opium for $300 from the Afghan farmers, but we can sell it for 16,000 US dollars to the European traffickers. From that money, we can buy weapons against the great Satan USA. We have to say thanks to the United Nations for keeping illegal the opium. Do you understand? Drug prohibition is a great thing, makes us rich and allow us to buy guns. Thanks to the United Nations, thanks to the prohibition. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, I'm Buford Terrell with Clay Jones and Dean Becker. Uh, I went to, had to go to a meeting of a different kind last Thursday night. Uh, and one of the men came in all of Twitter because Rick Steves was in town and giving a talk. Yep. And it was all about legalizing marijuana. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the celebrity around. bit does work. Uh, before we run out of time, uh, uh, do each of you guys have a last thought or comment or something you want to talk about about the conference? Well, I came away from the conference with the impression that with there are three states that are looking at legalization right now. Washington, Oregon, and California, not California, Colorado. Yeah. California has dropped their initiative to do it. Too, too fragmented to get it done. Right. Yeah. Uh, along with that and the 12 sitting presidents in Central and South America that are raising so much hell down there about uh, the drug war. They're saying they're tired of uh, dying and their people hurting because of uh, trying to stop the drugs from going to the United States, that it gave me a real big impression that it isn't much longer and it's going to be all done uh, when they can't have no cooperation from our southern uh, countries, from Mexico south. Yeah. It's pretty much over. Yeah. I, I, the, what I, I, I didn't see it in that clip from Pat Lycos, but she brought forward one of these old uh, ancient hysterical propaganda pieces, and that is that if you smoke marijuana, 
it's going to give you chromosome damage, and you're going, your kids are going to be deformed. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this is the type of stuff that holds this together, at least at that echelon. Yeah. They, quote, believe this. I, I talked to uh, uh, the assistant police chief who was there. He, he pointed out the guy laying on the floor. You know, he's, he's there because these people needed money. I said, sir, before prohibition, it cost about 25 cents a week for a cokehead to supply himself, maybe a dollar for a heroin junkie to, to uh, get his fix. Mm -hmm. And if multiply that by 10 for inflation, you're still talking $2.50 and $10 a week. Mm -hmm. Who's going to go in and shoot a store clerk for that kind of money to supply their habit? It is the prohibition. He started telling me, no, well, they're out of their mind. They're crazy. They're, they're just, it's, it's impossible for them to control themselves. And I had to walk away mumbling, you <laughs> ignorant son oh, of a gun. You, you might it. point out to him Switzerland, where in the now more than 15 years since they've started giving heroin directly to confirmed addicts, yeah. that property crime related to drugs has virtually disappeared. And there has not been a single overdose death among the participating right. addicts. Uh, yeah. But you know what struck me? about the conference, and I unfortunately couldn't go, was there's nobody new on the pro-drug war side. No. I mean, there hasn't been a new spokesman show up, and there was not any legitimate scientific spokesman, medical spokesman, academic spokesman for the drug war. And they keep bringing up the stuff like you mentioned. Chromosome the damage. The chromosome damage. <coughs> that was a study that was repudiated by the scientists that claimed to have found it back in the middle 1970s. Yeah. I mean, they're, they have nothing but this ancient history mm -hmm. to just yeah. dredge it up, try no, to see no, if it no, works. No, 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 not ancient history, ancient legend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. I, I, I stand corrected, yes. Uh, if I could, uh, I was yeah. wanting to tell folks that uh, um, my past shows, I, I, I produce shows for uh, KPFT here in Houston. Yeah. That's 90.1 FM on your radio dial. Um, each morning there, Monday through Friday at 9.57, they do a little three-minute piece. But on Sunday evenings, I do two half hours of yeah. cultural baggage and century of lies, beginning at 6.30 p.m. until 7.30. Uh, the, just yesterday, I had uh, Ethan Nadelman, about 20 minutes yeah. with him, a couple of reports from Terry Nelson of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, yeah. my band of brothers here. Uh, and we had a little clip from Pat Robertson yeah. saying it's time to legalize <laughs> weed. And, and then on the, the Century of Lies show was basically the Reverend Edwin Sanders II, yeah. Uh, his speech at the James A. Oh, Baker, yeah, the third good. conference, he was yeah. powerful. He's like Babe Ruth, uh, just yeah. knocking it out of the park. And uh, I urge you to uh, go to my website, which is drugtruth.net. You can uh, tune into both of those shows. They're already online. And for this coming week, we're going to be, uh, what was the guy's name, uh, John, uh, that debated Ethan? Uh, uh, Coleman. John Coleman. I'm going to have him giving his response to Ethan and then a little bit of debate between the two of them. Uh -huh. And then I think I'm probably going to bring in... Uh, 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 Senator Larry Campbell, who, when, when Lycos was talking, one of the old dredging yeah. from the past, she says, and we have to think back to when the British started the opium wars in China. <laughs> and and, pres and, and Senator, Senator Larry Campbell yelled from the back of the audience very loud, oh my God, you know, because it's dragging up the same old BS and trying to present it as if it were factual or useful. Well, there's one big difference. Pat, if you're listening, the British started the opium wars in China because the British were insisting on selling opium into China, breaking the Chinese laws. So they were the smugglers at that time. Uh, you know, Dean has probably interviewed more of the outstanding people connected to drug reform than anyone else I know. And if you go to his website and just prowl around, it's amazing what you'll find. And if we've got, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, well, if I, if I, I want, want to ask you about one person in particular, All right. because there's a new rising politician on the Texas stage that you may have some insight into, and that's former El Paso City Councilman Beto O'Rourke, who's running for Congress. Oh yeah, I, I've interviewed Beto. Mm -hmm. 
two or three times, had many great discussions without a recorder going, the yeah. man is intelligent, uh, he, he knows the situation, he's lived in El Paso his whole yeah. life. He, he enjoyed the two city uh, aspect of it where the, yeah. you would visit friends on the weekend yeah. and it was a, a free flow of yeah. exchange information and love, truthfully, until, well, President Calderon came along and said, we're going to end the yeah. drug war. And uh, what he did was escalate it and drive yeah. it uh, off the cliff. Yeah. Yeah. And but Beto is running for he was a El Paso City Councilman. Yeah. Now he's running for U.S. Congress. Yeah. And I think he stands a good chance to beat Ben Reyes. He's yeah. he's uh, standing yeah. tall. Yeah. Uh, anything else from either of you before? No. Yeah. I I just I I hope that people out there realize. As Clay, Clay says, the drug war is ending. It may take a year. It may take ten years. But that really depends on you. That depends on if you want to get involved. I talk to so many people who say, Dean, you're absolutely right. I just wish I didn't work for a, 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 a hospital. I wish I didn't work for a, a school. I wish I didn't work for such and such employer. I wish I had the ability to speak up and to do something about it. And the fact of the matter is there is, there are so few people on the other side in law enforcement or, or otherwise who are willing to stand up, who are willing to speak out and, and uh, Basically, if you educate yourself, there's nobody who can stand against you. There's nobody who can refute what you're saying because the drug war has no basis in reality. It's based on a pipe dream of men who died long ago. And the current day adherents are just hoping that you uh, allow them to meet another mortgage payment before you pull the plug on this madness. Well, let's put it this way. Do what Dean wants you to do is really very simple. All you have to do is let your state representatives, your state senators, and your congressional representatives know how you feel about it. And it's easy to do. They've all got websites with email addresses on the websites. They've all got <coughs> phone numbers. And if you really, really impress them, take the time to scrawl it on paper, even if your handwriting's as bad as mine, put a real stamp on it and send it through the mail because those are the ones that get read and that they pay attention to. Uh, we got a minute left here. I want to no. fill it with this thought that I, I am a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. That's leap.cc mm -hmm. on the web. I'm a former cop at this uh, Baker conference. There was at least two other leap speakers there. Yeah. Russ Jones was an invited speaker. Yeah. Terry Jones was there and he was interviewed by the local press. Yeah. And what I'm trying to say is we are a group of now 50,000 uh, total members, more than that worldwide. We've got about 200 speakers that want to come speak to yeah. your organization. And all you got to do is go to LEAP. Uh, there's an email link up there. Let them know who you are, where you are, and how many attendees you will have. And that will help them uh, put you on the agenda. And we will come speak to your organization. It's time yeah. to, uh, to, to pull the plug. Well, this has been an exciting hour. It really has. I, I, I've enjoyed it quite much. And we will be back in two weeks. But keep the pressure on your politicians. You're the boss. You just have to let them know it and keep reminding them of it. And thank you for joining us. Let's help make this Baker Institute meeting the the roadmark that we all up here think it is that it's a sign of better things to come in the very near future. Thank you guys for being with us tonight. Thank you all for tuning in and watching. And you'll be back for Drugs, Crime, and Politics in two more weeks. Thank you. It's been a good program. Yeah. to go get minimum mandatory than you. Uh, I began to understand that the 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple, damn prohibition, which can only mean one thing, legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. 
we really want to improve our urban neighborhoods, the most important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do, is end the war on drugs.